Whenever our cells break down amino acids, they generate ammonium as a byproduct, and as we know, ammonium is very toxic. So our liver, and to a smaller extent our kidneys, undergo the urea cycle, and this cycle allows us to transform this toxic molecule ammonium into a less toxic form urea, which is then transported via the bloodstream into our kidneys, where this molecule is eliminated by the kidneys via urine. And this is the only way by which our body can actually eliminate this ammonium, the byproduct of amino acid metabolism metabolism from our body. So what do you think would happen if there is some type of defect or deficiency in any one of the enzymes involved in the urea cycle? Well, since this is the only way by which we rid the body of ammonium that implies a deficiency in any one of these enzymes will decrease the ability of our liver, our body, to actually eliminate ammonium. And that will drive the levels of ammonium inside our body up. So that will cause a medical condition we call hyperammonemia, high levels of ammonium inside our blood. Now this is a very dangerous condition and it's especially devastating in infants who are born with defects in any one of these enzymes. So if an infant is born with a defect in any one of these enzymes, that will drive the levels of ammonium leading to this condition. Now why is that dangerous? Well, we think that high levels of ammonium inside our brain can essentially change the osmotic gradient between the inside and the outside of the cell because high levels of ammonium will essentially increase the levels of glutamine because the enzyme glutamine synthetase found in the brain essentially combines the ammonium with glutamate to form glutamine. And high levels of glutamine basically changes the osmotic gradient and that can lead to brain swelling and brain damage. And that's why hyperammonemia is dangerous in infants who are born with defects in any one of these, in any one of these enzymes. So to explore more of this concept, let's take a look at some of these defects, some of these inborn deficiencies. And let's begin with arginosuccinase deficiency. So arginosuccinase is the enzyme that essentially catalyzes step four, the conversion of arginosuccinate to arginine and, and also forming the fumarate. Now, normally what this does is this reaction continually replenishes the arginine, which essentially keeps reaction five, uh, which keeps reaction five going. And so by keeping this reaction going, we produce the ornithine that we need for step number two. And we also produce the urea, which is ultimately excreted by our kidney. Now, if this reaction stops, so let's stop this reaction. So this reaction no longer takes place or takes place at a low rate. Why? Well, because we have a deficiency in this enzyme. And so that will begin to decrease the levels of arginine. By decreasing the levels of this molecule, we decrease the levels of the reactant in this reaction and that drives the rate of reaction five to the ground. And so, we no longer are producing the urea and we're no longer generating the ornithine that we need for step number two because in step number two this carbamoyl phosphate combines with the ornithine to form the citrulline. And so ultimately that's what causes high levels of ammonium and that's what causes hyperammonemia. Now how do we treat a patient with this condition? Well, number one is we have to limit protein intake. By limiting the total protein intake in the individual, we decrease amino acid metabolism and so we decrease the production of ammonia. And number two is we have to increase the uptake of arginine. How would that help? 
Well, by increasing the levels of arginine, we essentially will replace the arginine. So we will increase the levels of arginine and by increasing the concentration of this reactant, we'll increase the rate of reaction five. And so by increasing the rate of this reaction, we produce the ornithine that we need in step number two. And so essentially, if we continually replace the arginine, we give the patient the arginine, we drive this reaction, and so that will allow step two to take place, and that will also allow step three to take place, because once we produce the citrulline by combining this molecule and this molecule, we essentially combine the aspartate with citrulline to combine arginosuccinate. Now, once we form this, by replacing this, the reaction still can't go this way. But luckily, our body has a way to actually eliminate arginosuccinate. And so ultimately, our body will get rid of that extra ammonium by combining the ammonium into this molecule and then continually forming citrulline. And then the second amino group will come from aspartate. And ultimately, our body, instead of ridding itself of ammonium via urea, it will rid itself of ammonium by getting rid of the arginosuccinate. Now, let's explore another deficiency and let's focus on step number one and step number two. So let's suppose we have a problem either in carbamoyl phosphate synthetase or ornithine transcarbamoylase. What would happen now? Well, notice that reaction one and two are before this cycle actually takes place. So if we just follow this circular arrow here, if we have a problem here or here, it's before the cycle takes place. And so by replacing any one of these intermediates, citrulline, this molecule, arginine, this molecule, that will do nothing in a person with carbamoyl phosphate deficiency uh, or ornithine, transcarb uh, um, ornithine transcarbamoyl deficiency. And so what will help? Well, again, we have to limit the total protein intake because that will limit decrease amino acid metabolism and decrease the ammonium production. But more importantly, what we have to do is we have to somehow rid the body of glutamine as well as glycine. Why? Was, well, as I mentioned earlier, if we have high levels of ammonium, that will increase the levels of glutamine in the body. It will also increase glycine. And so what we want to do is we want to somehow decrease the levels of glycine and glutamine inside our body. And so in a patient with either one of these deficiencies, we can give the patient benzoate and phenylacetate. Why? Well, because benzoate in the presence of coenzyme A and ATP will form benzoyl coenzyme A, and this molecule will react with glycine to form hippurate. And hippurate can, uh, can essentially be excreted by our kidneys. And so if we give the patient this drug here, then it will ultimately help eliminate that glycine from the body. Likewise, by giving the patient phenyl, um, phenyl acetate, that will combine with ATP and coenzyme A to form phenyl acetyl coenzyme A, and this ultimately rids the body of the glutamine buildup. So it combines with glutamine to form phenylacetylglutamine, uh, and so this can also be eliminated by the kidneys. And so in a patient with a problem in either one of these two enzymes, the ultimate goal is to get rid of that glycine and glutamine because high levels of ammonium will cause high levels of glycine and glutamine. And so we give these two drugs, we limit the amount of protein intake and that will alleviate some of the symptoms that are associated with this particular defect.